Hey, everybody. Welcome to uh, this inaugural episode, uh, interview episode for sure, of what we're calling Money Business for now. I have no clue if we'll stick with the name, but hey, for anybody who's launched a podcast before, started something, whether YouTube channel, podcast, uh, you know, the first few episodes are always out there of like just trying to get a feel for stuff. And I'm super excited because my first guest for this version of the show uh, is a guy who uh, I've gotten to know really, really well over the last year, year and a half. Um, his name is Ian Hogan. Uh, I, I really want to give some context here of how I got to meet Ian before we kind of jump into Ian's story and talk to him. But uh, Ian is a uh, an incredible guy. We actually got to know Ian, my business partner, Alex. We got to know Ian. Uh, we were looking for help with uh, sort of how do we create a continuation program for our existing clients? And we, we were following a good friend of ours, Ben McClellan. Uh, Ian happened to be uh, a part of his Empowered CEO team. And uh, Ian jumped in on calls with us. And as we got to know Ian, we ended up spending a lot of time on calls with Ian and just found to have this incredible energy. And I'm really excited because I don't really know the full story of Ian's business journey. And, you know, the theme of the show is going to be talking about business, about money, about, uh, you know, a lot of things that go kind of unnoticed. Uh, we, you know, there's a lot about business growth, business development, but, you know, sort of the the, the softer stuff of of this world of uh, how do we help people move forward, especially in their lives? And so, Ian, I am super incredibly excited to have you on the podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Will. It's uh pleasure's all mine. We I always enjoy our conversation. So me too. Go. <laughs> Dude, let's let's do this. I uh I uh I normally would give a more in-depth intro. To be honest, I was actually doing some LinkedIn searching before this. There are a lot of Ian Hogan's out there. I'm not gonna lie. There are a lot of Ian Hogan's. There's even Ian Hogan's in like upper New York. Uh, that are not you. And so I was like, oh my gosh, I can't find the back end story of, of Ian. And so Ian, obviously I know you from a, a business context. I know a little bit more uh, you know, about you uh, as a person in terms of things you've done, but um, you were, uh, were you always an entrepreneur? I should start that way. When you were kind of starting your journey of going into an adult and the working world, did you start out uh, as a business owner? Was that kind of your original plan? Uh Actually, kind of interesting story. My my first uh, profession, I guess, or my first endeavor into actually ownership of a business, I was a musician. So um, I we had to actually create an LLC and all these things when we signed with a record label and all that jazz. So um, I was just inherently usually uh, all about like following passion and I loved music. Um, I was big into sports and then music when I was in like middle school, high school. Once, once I got into music, it was, that was it for me. And, uh, actually ended up joining a band in Brooklyn, uh, in my early twenties. And then we signed with like a major record label and did the whole, the whole jam there. And that was my first foray into the business world because I was literally, I joke with people, but it's, it's true. I was reading, negotiating a record track contract for dummies, like trying to figure out the new kids. Like when you're dealing with like millions of dollars and you're, you're like, uh, I consider myself a kid. I was in my early twenties, right? I I didn't know anything, yeah, yeah. so it was really really interesting because I was like, oh, this is amazing. I didn't expect this as soon as it was, even though I've been playing for probably like seven plus years. And and you hit that level of, oh, this is the thing that I was like, oh, once I do this, everything's just gonna. It's the happily ever after thing, right? Yeah. yeah. And you realize, oh, now we just have to keep going. Yeah. Uh, so that was a really interesting foray into entrepreneurship. And right before that, oftentimes what I would do uh, for work when we were like, you know, figuring things out and before I started getting a salary as a musician, um, I'd often, you know, go work at a local business or something. And I was tinkering. I couldn't help it. I wanted to like, I uh, one business I put all, I was like 18, 19 years old. They were all uh, like still handwriting receipts and I'll, I'll age myself a little bit. This was in the 2000s. So uh, I'm almost 40. Let's just, yeah. we'll start there. We'll put it out um, there. Yeah. And uh, I might say things like MySpace, like I hope I don't <laughs> offend anyone, but it's, it's like uh, I naturally have this tendency to tinker and I love creating systems around efficiency. And I love thinking like, could this be done better? Could there be a more helpful result to the client or uh, for the team so they can grow. And that always was where my brain would tend to go. It would almost bother me if things were inefficient. So yeah. I would uh, probably just to solve that problem in my head, I would just do that. And then they'd promote me to different things. And 
and that's that's my foray in a business initially uh, i would end up either becoming like more management or partners or something but i was i was younger once again i didn't really like know what i wanted to do music was the thing and then yeah. when i went into music it was great so i went the label a lot of stuff happened in that year my father passed away um and i had a, just a lot of life events that made me like yeah kind of you know you question your own morality you question or, or mortality rather um yeah. but and, and maybe then, both uh, who knows you know there's yeah, a lot both. of life changes going on yeah, yeah. So yeah i made this shift it was around 2008 2009 because yeah. we had gotten to these great levels and you know it was like it was i was paid for everything was just kind of there yeah. yeah and i realized i was like man i want to help people at a greater depth um, I, I think a lot of it had to do with my father passing with health stuff and everything else. Uh, we used to have a, a PT and a PT assistant come to the house because my, my father was a paraplegic. So he would come and stretch him out a couple times a week. I noticed, you know, better health benefits, all this other stuff and his quality of life improved quite a bit. Yeah. So I think in the back of my mind, it's like, oh man, do I want to go to, uh, you know, uh, school to be a doctor? Do I want to go back to school to be a PT, a chiro, whatever? I settled on massage therapy because it was that thing where I could do a lot of the things these other practitioners did, yeah. but I didn't have to go to school for another eight years or whatever the thing yeah. was. So that was my kind of foray so much smarter than me. Yeah. into that. And, uh, and, and then what happened was like, I, the next thing after all of that, I know I'm just kind of jumping around like crazy, no, no, but no, no, I love it. Um, so after music, I transitioned into, um, I went to massage school um, yeah. and, you know, got my degrees or whatever you want to call it. And I partnered um, with, uh, actually I had my own practice for eh, about a year, year and a half, grew my client base was just like at capacity. And I was like, Oh crap. Like I can't take any more clients. What do I do? Yeah. So I hired a couple of people, you know, did the typical thing. Most business owners do like, Oh, what do I do now? Um, so yeah. I learned a lot of it in the trenches. And once again, this was in like early 2000. 10, 11, 12. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, while oh, 10 years ago now, which is crazy yeah. to say that kind of thing. Uh, and after that, it was, I ended up partnering with uh, a guy who has a degree in kinesiology. He owned a CrossFit gym. Yeah. So, we partnered, and then I partnered with a doctor of chiropractic in, in the clinic. So, I actually owned two separate businesses because of good old New York State. We had to be separate entities um, mm. and, and did that from pretty much like 2012 or 13 on to, I sold the clinic and at the end of 2019 and then the, the gym, uh, during COVID. So it was kind of like, that was my foray into brick and mortar. Yeah. And then I started consulting while I owned those businesses, because I was backing out, I started consulting other usually local wellness businesses, things like that, and started just recognizing these patterns hmm. and going, wow, people really struggle with uh, client experience, retention systems, especially practitioners, because the ones who are really good at what they do, A, struggle with communicating it to the average client. And yeah. B, it's like they don't want to be bogged down to admin, but they just are like, oh, you know, with like notes and with insurance oh, yeah. companies and with yeah. all that stuff. So I got that down to a science. We would just, you know, have that be minimal work for the practitioner. So that's what I helped a lot of people with initially. And then we switched over to um, all the, the wonderful world of online business, which was really interesting. That was a whole, just my mind yeah. was blown because you see a lot of people who are really good at marketing sales and sales, but they really struggle with retention and fulfillment. And I was like, Oh, we had like a sub 3% churn for a gym, which was unheard of. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't even know that was good. I just was like, Oh, it's just what we do. Yeah. Um, but we also, I remember learning, uh, remember Facebook ads around like 2017 when you can just like, <laughs> like hit a button and get like a yeah. thousand leads and it was like, it cost like nothing. Um, so I, I learned all that stuff and, and thought it was really interesting because then I learned, oh, if you reach out to like colder markets or people that don't know you, it's a different challenge and, and went, went through all those phases. Yeah. Anyways, long-winded story, pretty much went from musician to uh, getting into the health, healthcare and wellness field, and then uh, online space and consulting. And here we are today. And, yeah. and yeah, like you said, I met Ben a uh, year and a half, two years ago, we actually met previously, he came to my to my gym, and we we did a walk, a walk around a walkie meeting when he it was, I think it was before traffic and funnels days it was 
before he was transitioning. Yeah. And we were kind of talking about, cause he had, he had owned a yoga studio. Right. And right. Had very similar, like eerily similar paths as far as like business ownership. Cause he was, he's a, he's a drummer. Yeah. Um, he's, he's a great drummer actually. I didn't know that about Ben. Wow. Yeah. Awesome oh my gosh. Yeah. And, and a, a xylophonist. I don't know if that's what wow. you call it. Yeah. Really okay. good. Yeah. 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 Um, so we had met then, and then we uh, reconnected uh, with Empowered, and that was yeah. that's been like an amazing experience, and that that opened my eyes up because Ben has an incredible network, and he's just like a connector, yeah. um, and he's just really really awesome at that, and he's a uh, Facebook favorite troll as well. So he really is. He really we is. I appreciate his sense of humor. I I have sarcasm. I just don't. You you've like you looked me up on social. Right. I have like no presence. So it's yeah yeah that's purposeful right now. <laughs> Yeah. Oh man. Well, Ian, there's so many directions I, I want to go. I, I, uh, I, I got to just go with like the, the curious part of myself. First off, just huge thanks for, for giving us that background stuff that I didn't know. And it's eerily uh, similar to my journey as well. And, yep. um, you know, Alex, uh, my business partner, we you know started out, um, neither one of us knew we were going to end up in business ownership and ended up going to physical therapy school. Gosh, you're so much smarter than us doing the massage route and not going all those years of school. Uh, uh, it was just ridiculous. But um, so really similar journey. I think that's probably part of the reason we connect so well. It's just uh, having kind of a same career path in a, in a way. But yeah, I first got asked, just out of curiosity, what instrument did you play or were you a singer? And then I got a question about the biz, like business of music, if you're cool with that. Yeah, absolutely. I I definitely it was fire hose to the face. So I learned a lot by I bet. Oh my gosh. By, uh, failing. So um I played guitar and I sang. That was my those were my primary instruments. So I was a lead singer and uh Is guitar, this a band guitar we would was, know or a group we would have heard of. Can uh it somewhere. Do you feel comfortable no, sharing? No, te- technically they the this the owner and the songwriter ended up getting his songs back when we mm, when okay. I, I, I felt a little bad. Like when I when I had left the band. Um, we had like looked for, I'd tried to help them find a new singer and everything else, but the label ended up like dropping the the band yeah. after, after I left. And you know, that, that sucked because it was, it was actually like a lawyer oversight, which was a great lesson also mm-hmm. in business because yeah. our, our contract was like ironclad, but there was one clause about if a key member leaves, they can, they have a, they have the opportunity. So all he had to do theoretically, at least what I was told was just keep me on as a minority percentage. It could have been like point whatever. Yeah, yeah, and and they wouldn't have been able to do that. So, but that was a great, a great lesson for me too. And like uh, learning enough about legal to make sure you're, you know, you're, you're covering those kinds of things. Um, yeah. Anywho. Yeah. Yeah. So singer, guitar, okay. that yeah. was, those, you know, I'm choppy at every other, I can like play drums and, you know, piano and stuff, but not like just chop around at it. You know? Hey. I mean, guitar and singing is more than uh, it's more than most people can do, including myself. So I, I have mad respect. I think if there's anything I could have, if I could like choose one skill, it would be to be able to sing. I just think it would be incredible. I, I know I'm capable of it. If you're out there listening, um, trust me, it's 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 it is a work in progress. But I haven't. I'm super curious, and I know this isn't like what we uh, <laughs> probably the theme of the episode. But like, how does a band? How does a band like become a business and get paid? So do you form yeah. as an LLC? Do you become like an entity within a, a record label and they take you on the record labels? What pays you and you're an employee of the record label? I have no clue how that even works. Yeah. So I'll give you the, the 2008, nine version. Sure. Yeah. Whatever it was. Yeah. Yeah. Because yeah. You got to remember this was before a lot of the streaming services became yeah. popular. So the whole music industry actually shifted. Yeah. Um, how you would make money as, as an artist typically was you'd have a couple routes, right? So you'd have, in my opinion, the most sustainable was usually licensing, right? So like say a movie or a video game or a TV, something picked up your, um, song, your yeah. song and then, yeah. and it would just be almost like similar to syndication, I guess you could say it would just, you get paid almost royalties on that. Yeah. And um, that would be huge because usually it's, you know, it's, it's already done. You're good to go. Yeah. Yeah. Album sales actually are usually like terrible for a musician. It's yeah. usually not the place they make the most money. Like they, they gave us a cap of like, Oh, you could make up to 25 mil or up the first, whatever mil, like some absurd numbers in the contract. But usually you made, you made a lot of money on touring and merchandise actually back in that day. 
the, at least at least when you looked at the splits of like how yeah. the margins would make sense, it would be that because there's all these complicated things around points and different things with um with like album music sales. I don't I don't know enough now about it to know what streaming how that takes place. Like we once again we're back in the day when we still had physical CDs, which is yeah. I know bonkers. Like yeah. how dare. Yeah. But it's uh yeah, usually as a musician you make money or or mm -hmm. obviously if you're songwriting or producing, you can make money that way. If you're engineering, like there's so many different avenues you can take. But at least from a record label standpoint, what we had to do, we had to create two LLCs, particularly for this label. Okay. Um, one was I think it was more like I want to say like a licensing arm or or something to do with that. I, I'm a little hazy on it. Yeah, yeah. And then, the, yeah. and then the other one, I think, was either for merch or for album or something. So there were two separate ones. Yeah. For that deal that we we actually had to set up, so the uh, lawyer just set it up for us, and that was the first time I learned about actually setting up an LLC and you know, like members of the LLC and all that stuff. And I didn't know that much about tax at the time because I was in my early 20s. So like <laughs> what early 20 year old musician is like, let's read about tax law, Yeah, like zero. So <laughs> you, you, you trust a lot of the people around you and you do the best you can with that. Cause you're usually like, I was always the green one. I was, I was like, Oh, cool. I'll get to learn something. That'll yeah. be fun. Yeah. Um, but that's typically how you do it. I think okay. nowadays, I don't okay. know if, it's just, I think streaming services might be a split or a cut. I okay. think that's how it works. I'm not positive yeah. though. I, I, I'm not an expert on that. Yeah. Um, but I guess I'm I'm super, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm kind of curious because I, one, one thing that comes to mind is like, if, if you're listening to this and you own a business and you, you don't have someone on your team that like loves to learn about the, just the, the dirty nuance stuff that most people don't want to know about, AKA taxes, uh, yep. all that kind of stuff. Like, please find someone like whether that's, that's a make, vet, that's a good it. accountant, vet, a vet, a financial person, somebody who loves to look at that. It's just, I mean, it's obviously what we do now, but it, it was yeah. such a source of stress for us in the first two years of our business. Like to the point, it was like, what's the point, you know, just like you said, as a young kid, you, I feel that way when we were starting our business, uh, it's like, Ooh, a hundred thousand dollars of revenue. That's a hundred thousand dollars. It's like, no, nope, not quite. You, you don't get to keep, uh, nearly, uh, nearly that much. And, um, I, I guess I was super curious, how did you get paid from a, like, uh, setup wise? Like, does that, does the label pay the LLC and you guys pay each other individually? Like how, how would that have worked out structure? I don't even know. Yeah, that was, it was kind of like a distribution. So I was guaranteed a certain amount, you know, oh, okay. as like a salary essentially. Um, okay. and, and that was, yeah, they would, they would make payments over, to there and it would get distributed so um it's kind of i guess it would almost be similar if you contracted someone yeah so you're like i'm contracting the llc we have this agreement we make we make payments out at these rates and if you look at it for a lot of record labels uh at least the deals that were being done before it's almost kind of like a like a loan in, in a way because they would yeah. pay out x amount but they would be expect they would be expecting a ton back up front on any any kinds of sales or specific kinds mm. of things you know plus think of it, it's kind of plus interest because they're going to get a percentage right was... ideally forever for for them yeah. and yeah, yeah. so their it's idea really, is really a betting you know, game kind of right you're just betting yeah, on they're on investing the yeah. yeah they're yeah. investing in the bit in the band and and they make a certain amount of if you think about it a label just makes a certain amount of investments per year usually they right. might have in-house uh nowadays it's even easier to record but like we were yeah. back in the day where we'd, we'd go to a recording studio. Um, yeah. And so they're betting on all this. They're hiring all those things. They're taking care of those costs. Typically, I, every deal is different. But yeah, yeah. for us, yeah. they were just taking care of X, Y, Z. We were sending them songs and stuff like that. And then they would deal with, obviously, like PR and release and all that stuff. And in return, you know, you're, you're giving them a pretty hefty cut usually, which I understand because if they're doing all of that work um, right. through distribution and stuff. It makes sense. Nowadays, very different yeah. because I th I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but I know it's like this with podcasts, but probably with music, you can just upload your stuff to oh, yeah. streaming services and they're going to take a cut for distribution, but yeah. it's very different. Like you, you have much yeah. more control now on how your, uh, I guess you could say on your artistry or creative um, endeavors, you don't have to like check with people. You can just go do it and see what happens now obviously 
now it's flooded the market with a lot of artists, which is, which is cool, but yeah. Um, yeah. And then it's a whole business on its own, but yeah, man, for me, it was the business stuff for that was really interesting. Cause I wasn't thinking as much about the business. Yeah. 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 You're an artist, man. You're, yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I think it's super fast. I mean, just, it's sorry. It's fascinating to me as a business model of like, oh. and then now thinking now how you're right, totally has, you know, flipped upside down from, a. um, you know, the powers and the streaming services of being able to be picked up, get seen. Uh, and then, you know, like, I, I don't know the numbers, but, you know, based on what I know, if you, you know, have a couple hundred thousand dollars or a couple hundred thousand followers or subscribers on YouTube, like you might be making 20, 30, 40 K a month just on, on ad revenue, which is like yeah. wild. Right. And then, yeah. um, but yeah, it's just, I think it's just so cool. It's a business model. I've never really known much about i think most people it's a foreign concept right of just like oh yeah they get paid and you're like yeah but like how do these people get paid um yeah before before i was on the label it would be like i'd go play a show and they would just pay me like that's how yeah. you made money yeah. and you would hopefully sell some albums and do things but that was it was merch and it was it was playing shows because how do you build an audience when you don't have right. you know net now Internet you can do it from your house. It's like, yeah. it, it's fascinating to me because I can see how creators can monetize so much more and have a living without, yeah. without doing half as much, which is, which is fascinating yeah. because I like it. Cause I think most creators just want to be able to, they just love doing it. Yeah. And if they can get a baseline revenue to a certain point, it's just like most entrepreneurs, they really just usually want to hit enough numbers so then they can explore and do the things they want to do, maybe spend time with their family or, you know, yeah. go impact more people on a different level. So I think that's what most people want, I find, uh, that yeah. I talk to. Yeah. And, and especially creatives, because it's that weird thing around your albums. Like, who's it for? Yeah. 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 Uh, you, you bring something up interesting that, I think is a, is a great sort of transition, which is, uh, Ian, you and I, you know, having followed you for a while and, and really hearing your philosophy and Ben as well, of, um, you know, a lot about kind of, uh, what's the deeper purpose to all of this. I think so many people who are listening to this are going to be interested in business and money, yeah. um, typically lends to personality types that are, uh, you know, more doers, like, let's go, let's do stuff. Let's, let's, you know, and, yeah. and it's hard to turn that switch off. Um, you've obviously built successful businesses. You, you've built a massage uh, therapy uh, clinic. You had the gym partnership. Uh, you okay. sold both of those. And uh, you're a guy in your early 40s where most people, uh, you know, I think a lot of people are like, man, I'm just starting to hit my stride in all of this. And uh, you've been able to make some really cool decisions to be able to sell, to free things up. And um, I'd love to just dive into a little bit on kind of like, how have you figured out and maybe not figured out what's your journey been as you've been going through this to figure out what's enough, like what's enough for Ian, what's enough for, you know, I, I, I don't want to be like, Hey, def what's your seven step formula for finding out what's enough for yourself. Like well, I'm just super curious your journey on, yeah. I imagine you've gone through a phase of like want more, 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 and then, you know, having to face some kind of reflection or just super curious on your journey. I think a lot of the owners listening to this are, you know, people are like, I'm just chasing, 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 but how have you kind of come to your own terms of what's enough? Yeah. I'll leave it at that. That's a great question. Um, it's one of my favorite questions actually yeah, to ask yeah. people. So well done. Well done, sir. Um, I learned from I, the best, man. <laughs> <laughs> um, Pat, Pat's on backs. <laughs> so for, for me, it, it tends to be a couple of years ago. I remember a distinct call it reflection or inflection point. I had been, you know, I'd had tons of different mentors and coaches, and I recommend that for people too, uh, especially time money thing. Like to me, getting somebody, following somebody or getting help from somebody who not only is in a place that you want to be, but has like similar values and actual, like a life that you want, not yeah. just, oh, they made a billion dollars. like great, but they're like family hates them. Like they don't have like that to me, no judgment, like live your best life. But for me, I'm very much, you know, I think about my day to day, like, what do I want my life to look like? 
I always would ask. Hey, Ian, people, are you saying they can't buy another family with a billion dollars? So I mean, I guess you, you probably could. There's probably <laughs> there's probably a program or a master class there. for that. How to, how to buy your your second your or third second families family. when the yeah. first one failed. Um, because you were chasing a billion dollars <laughs> and you didn't know why. Um <laughs> Free bonus bump. Um, no offense, uh, anybody out there who's bought a second family. No, yes. none, you know, yeah. No I'm problem. not. I'm not judging anyone. I've made a lot of <laughs> mistakes in my life, and I'm not going to pretend like I'm perfect or whatever else. So, no judgment here. It's just more of a reflection, like you said. So, for yeah. me, the I'll, I'll go with the last reflection because it's the most memorable for me. A couple of years ago, and it was before I made some of the changes in in my businesses. I, you know, it was pre-COVID, so it actually. COVID became, uh, I guess, a catalyst for me to, oh, cool. I guess we're definitely doing this now. Yeah. So I just, I sat with my wife and we had, we had a distinct conversation about, you know, what mattered most, what we want our life to look like. And we broke it down. Uh, my brain goes into like, what do things really cost? What are the hidden costs? What are the maintenance costs? What's the cost of cognitive burden or anxiety? You know, we have two little boys that are five and eight right now. So we said, what do we want our lives to look like? And, you know, we talked through it and it usually came down to time and energy freedom, mm -hmm. autonomy, sovereignty with our time and our energy and being able to raise our voice and just be present for them as they, as they grow up and be present for each other, spend more time with friends and family. And we both have a sense of wanting to have like an impact and help other people. But my wife and I are both very similar where we tend to not be like, I'm going to be put myself out there and be like the, she, she will do more so because she's, uh, she's a fantastic uh, yoga instructor and she runs teacher trainings and, and stuff like that. So she'll actually be more forward facing and putting herself out there. I tend to be a little more in the background um, yeah. as you found on social media. <laughs> uh, I tend to be the, the person behind the person and that that's where I tend to love my role because, you know, I, I don't mind putting myself out there, but it's just not my natural tendency. Yeah. So yeah. for me enough, it came down to like, well, what's the life you want to live really cost? But what mm. does it cost with like time, energy, attention, money, relationships, like thinking of currencies that were like, what was the money for? Yeah. And yeah. once you have that conversation with yourself and especially your loved ones, and you can really get to that root for us it was oh if we have enough for this kind this kind of freedom so i shorten my work hours per week right so i said well can i do i have an efficiency brain can i achieve the same or a better outcome with that mm -hmm. and then i got into investing a lot more saying can i put my dollars to work uh so my time is because my time is the most valuable thing to me and my health is the most valuable thing to me and i think a lot of people say that but they don't behave that way yeah. And I, I certainly wasn't, I was trading a lot of my time for things that just didn't really make sense for my goals. And I think what's so challenging about it is it is, I'll be honest, it's a little painful sometimes when you're reflecting on the stuff and you go, oof, I said, I want this thing, but I'm doing this other thing yeah. and they're not really aligned. And for me, it would be, uh, I was, I was a big, like, like I say, I'm a recovering savior holic where I was big into if you're in a Cartman's triangle, like the rescuer, I was yeah. very much like, I want to help people, but I would go to that level of sacrificing and probably like over helping, like over fixing, doing things for people, not yeah. empowering them. So I made that shift a couple of years ago and that changed almost everything for me. Um, yeah. Getting better at holding the mirror. So once again, long winded answer, I guess I'm good at those. Uh, <laughs> For me, enough was calculating. We actually sat down and calculated. Um, yeah. Like, yeah. what do we need on a regular basis to live this life? And then I'll be honest, like in about two, three years, like I choose the clients I work with. I work when I want to, uh, similar to my wife. And we hang out with our kids most of the days. And yeah. it, it's super enjoyable. And, you know, I'm I have the tools that if I want to change it, I can go back and reflect and we can change our trajectory. And I guess you could say that's kind of what I'm, my goal is what I'm trying to do with business owners is help them find those resources they already have and give them the tools so they can 
live the life, whatever their version of that is, right? Everyone's different. Yeah. So yeah. some people say, I want to spend more time with my family. Some people say, I do want to make X amount more so I can impact or so I can serve this many clients. Those are all like, there's no right or wrong answer. I'm yeah. just going to push a little harder and say like, what's it for? Yeah. I think that's that. Yeah. I, I, I think that's, uh, you know, it's one of those things you, you hear someone say and you're like, yeah, I should do that. And then, you know, I would imagine 99.9% .9 of people then don't do anything about it. And I, I uh, so I, I think it's, you know, I, I think it's just super powerful that you, you sat down and, and maybe also having someone in your life, like your wife, who is on board with that as well to, you know, to encourage that. I think I'd love to, I don't know if you'd be able to expand a little bit on, um, you talk about sort of calculating it all out. And I know, you know, maybe there are crazy algebraic formulas, but I imagine there's some basic stuff of like talking about uh, you finding the currency of things. And, uh, I, you know, I'd love to just kind of dive into your, your, any insights you have on kind of how you thought through that. I think it's really the money side and time, right? We can quantify into hours, right? We can quantify into dollars. We can even go, well, I have an hourly rate of this, therefore it equals this much time. I think when we get into the reality of stuff, we know it's it's never that quite straightforward or that simple. Yeah. Um, so I just, as you and your wife sat down, you know, you're thinking through like calculating this stuff out of like, what do we really need? just were there parameters? Did you have like a framework that you're kind of working off of or, or one you found as you went through it? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and two things, because one, something you just said before that, when you said, you said something about why, uh, shoot, how did you put it? Almost why people, why do people struggle with going through this stuff? I, yeah. I have a theory for that. I have a theory for this. Oh yeah. Okay. I, hear I that. think people who are visionaries and they're quick action and they usually are great at initial that they're they're much quicker to implement they're good at attaining things they really mm -hmm. struggle with sustaining things and my theory is you know and i could be wrong on this but so far it's it's held up pretty true is usually when you're attaining things you're adding when you're sustaining it's usually about the removal of things that are no longer serving you or helpful and i think that's i think the problem with that for most people who are quick action or or entrepreneur or visionary or whatever once you remove you have a lot of space to fill and that feels very scary to a lot of people yeah. to just have space um, yeah. when you've identified with being a doer or a busy person or whatever. And I guess that's my, yeah. my theory. It's like, it's like mental hoarding to like, as a, yes. as a survival strategy, you know, like yep. a survival mechanism in some ways. I, I like that. I hadn't thought about it that way. Yeah. And I think I see it. It's so prevalent in the space because you just see people repeating patterns in different areas of their life. Or, or what's really interesting is when they, when someone doesn't recognize that they're doing contradicting things, like they're successful over here, but they're doing the opposite thing over here. And they're like, why isn't it working? It's like, well, just repeat the reliable thing. And I think what's very, what I do with businesses is I, I put in, I, t I talk with them about how can you put in constraints? So you're protecting yourself from yourself, but you can go feel like you're exploring all day long. Yeah. but you're not blowing up the reliable thing that's like allowing yeah. you to do that. So I think that's part A, but then coming back to the question with my wife and I having the conversation, I love the framework and, uh, and full, full credit where it's due. This was like a Nick and Dan thing I learned from, from them. Yeah. Uh, they, they use a case framework. So it's compile, assess, strategize, execute. So I think people who tend to be more quick action, they either, they go right to strategize or execute over and over and over again. And yeah. they don't actually go and see, wait, 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 what's happening here? And, and a great example, you look at a business and they have like 18 offers and you're like, cool, which, which ones are the most profitable or the most whatever? And they don't usually know that. And it's just compiling information that's already there. And, and I'll say that's how my wife and I started. I said, listen, let's just, uh, similar if you're doing weight loss, right? Like where the Fitbit for a couple of weeks, let's just see what's going on. And we did the same thing with our finances where I said, let's look back in the last couple of years and see our trends and see our patterns. And the painful part here is you try to do your best to do it without judgment. You're just discerning. You're just like, hey, what happened? Yeah. 
So and tough. So tough to do. It's extremely yeah. difficult, especially with couples. I've actually, I actually have a couple of clients that are business owners and they're they're married. And we talk through, hey, you think about money this way, your spouse thinks about money this way. Yeah. And so you guys kind of talk past each other sometimes. So just understanding and listening to that person and, and trying to put yourself in their shoes and have empathy, it's going to be the the biggest the biggest thing because they feel like you're judging them every time you say, just do it this way. It doesn't actually help behavior, but we think like, we think we're right. Right. Yeah. Instead of like being useful and listening to somebody else. So for my wife and I, you know, every now and again, you'll see stuff and you'll be like, Oh, like, why are they buying this thing? Like that's such a waste of money. Right. That's the typical thing. But then I know she's probably thinking the same thing about some stuff I'm buying. And I'm like, Oh, it's for the business. Yeah, you know, yeah, it's like, yeah, yeah. is it, is it though, Ian, is it for the business? <laughs> and, uh, you know, but but then once yeah. you zoom out, you realize we all have our things. And instead of judging or having guilt and shame about it, you just go, no, it's just a thing. Let's explore that a little bit. And once you understand what it is, and there are multiple ways to, to uh, get that thing, you realize money is one of those, uh, but there's all these other resources. And for, for my wife and I, I would just keep asking questions and remain curious and be like, oh, interesting. It wouldn't be like, why did you buy that? It would be, think about my tonality. It's like, oh, interesting. Is that going to be like a recurring thing that you want to do each month? Or is that going to be something like a one-off? And once she saw the framework, we use the certainty app, which I love. She was like, I love this thing because she got to see just in real time, like, oh, if I make this decision, I just have to think through where does that come from? So once you can start thinking about opportunity cost in real time and go, oh, if I just move this from here to here, I don't have to really change my life that much. And that's what I think most people want. They actually want to not feel like there was a massive change in their behavior, but get the results. And you do that by micro-stepping people. So for my wife and I, we just asked each other what matters. And and for her, it was time freedom. So I was like, cool. How much time? How much time is enough? Ooh, great question. And then we we inverted it. And I think this is one of the important things that most people struggle with. If you just ask somebody what they want, that's a very hard question for a lot of people. Yeah. It, you either get a fire hose or you get like, uh, but if you ask someone what they don't want, it's a lot easier for them to, to kind of give you something like, oh, I definitely don't want this. So I'll give you a great example. Uh, hey, uh, what do you, what's a good father look like? What does that look like? It's like, uh, what? I mean, that's a tough, tough answer. But if you say, what would I want to avoid to be a, to be a bad? And I use good and bad. I don't mean to like, it's easy for people to understand. And you go, well, I, I, I want to make sure like my, my kids eat and like, they don't like, how do I help them not die? Right. That, that's a good start. Like, let's start with that. <laughs> but, it, yeah. but it forces you, it forces you to think about your own behavior, right? Because kids are a perfect example of your kids are usually just a reflection of your own behaviors. It's like a giant mirror. Yeah. So I think what's fascinating is when you talk about this stuff and you say, all right, let's think about it in time or like how much energy something takes. And it could be effort. It could be like, how does it affect your health? Um, a perfect example some people might say, hey, I want to pay off my house. And you go, well, that's not the best financial decision because um, like your, your uh, mortgage is only 3% and you could, you could put it here and you could do this. But that person might just go, I'll just sleep better at night. Oh, well, that's a huge benefit probably long-term to your life. Like probably give you a few extra years to your health. You'll probably make better decisions. And, and I think what I've realized over time is once you view people as the individual, instead of being like, there's a one size fits all that everyone needs to follow. It makes it so much easier to, uh, to strategize. So compile. So we went through all of our kind of history. We looked at our energy and spending cycles throughout the year. We kind of broke down some of that stuff and just assessed it all and said, what are things that we're probably going to keep doing? Cause we've proven that, that those are our behaviors. Yeah. Um, and now we made a strategy instead of saying like good, bad, right, wrong. We said, well, that's probably going to happen. So how do we put constraints in place to give us kind of, um, boundaries to let us know, okay, you now need to look at this thing before 
say you go into more debt or before you uh, make this purchase. So what my wife and I, all we did, we have a, we have a weekly meeting. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I was just, just going to ask how often do you guys we have a, out on this? Yeah. Well, we're technically business partners too in, in one of the businesses. Okay. So yeah. but we have a weekly meeting and it's usually 20 minutes, maybe 30 minutes. And we always start with the same things like, hey, I say anything coming up with finances we do first and then we do our schedules, anything out of the ordinary. Because what does that promote? It promotes us to say like, we have to think about it. Like, is there any like spending or time of time, money, attention, whatever that's unusual? Yeah. And then we talk it through. Okay. And then we, we if we need to shift or move things around, it's no big deal. It becomes a collaborative session. So once you can move from that combative kind of like um, us versus them, me versus you, like I'm right, you're wrong into yeah. like, let's collaborate and make this thing happen together. Cause we both have similar values. It's amazing. Like we, we love talking about this stuff now and she's much more comfortable. And um, because this is the funny part. I think I've said this to you for most visionaries, you put a spreadsheet in front of them. They want to throw up or punch you in the face. It's like the worst thing you can do. Yeah. 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 So I've learned that yeah. I've learned that by just watching people's eyes glaze over when I'm like, but look how much money we saved. They're like, cool, man. Just tell me what I need to do next. <laughs> um, so what I've learned is I just go talk through the behaviors. They save the money. And I'm like, cool, where do you want to put that now? So I, I, we just went on vacation uh, and I went with one of my old business partners. We're, we're really good friends. Yeah. Uh, found 100K in, in a couple of days because just look through systems, certain efficiency things, yep. certain payment things, certain whatever, and you just find it and you go, huh. And people are like, it can't be that simple. And you're like, yeah, it's the removal of things that are no longer serving. It's mm -hmm. just a different way of thinking about business and life. And I think it keeps coming back to cool. What's the money for? Where are you going to put that now? That's going to actually benefit your life. Cause it's cool to do have million dollar businesses and all that stuff. Like it's fun, but it's like, what's it for? Like, how does it actually tangibly help? Like I, I don't notice my life changing drastically. If my net worth says, you know, 3 million or 4 million, like there's not like a, yeah. Yeah. you know what I mean? Like there's not yeah, like yeah. a, yeah. like so all of a sudden, change? like new doors open to parties that never, you know, that you're not even going to anyways, right? So like, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's like, so, so for me, if I don't have that meaningful work and relationships and everything else, like you just feel it, it just feels different. So, but that's, that's important to me. Like it could be something different for you and it could be something different for anyone listening. And I think that's the important piece. It's sitting with yourself. Like, so maybe you don't have a spouse. Maybe you're just, you're just like, ah, I'm a solo business owner, right? But has that why changed? Because your head's just been buried and grinding and like trying to make things work. You hired a bunch of people. Now you feel responsible for them or, you know, you have a bunch of clients and you don't want to upset anybody because you're just trying to help people. Those are usually the things that are the most painful. It's usually when you have to let go of relationships. That's usually what's I find is most painful for people yeah. to remove. Yep. Yeah. yeah, we've noticed that as well. I think, uh, you know, on, on our side, dealing a lot with uh, similar to you of numbers, right? Just going through and, and anytime it comes into, Hey, the reality is where we've either overpaid or we've overstaffed uh, and the numbers just don't, don't even make sense here. And it's like, we're, you know, we're not trying to make a emotional decision, but I understand that regardless of logic, it is a very painful thing to let, let people go. Um, yeah. It just, all this makes me think of, there's so much power in, um, you know, for business owner therapy, like really, I think it's, it's so powerful. Like I just, uh, whether that's a working with a coach or if you're in a mastermind community or you literally find someone who just helps you sit and reflect and think about this. I think we get so caught up in, like you said, where, where to next, what's next, what's next versus, well, have you even looked at where you've been? Like, have you even looked at what's going on to get here? And I, I really admire you and your wife in for being able to do that. And, and there's so much power in being proactive, right? Like being, um, I think so much, we just live in a state of reactivity and it's like, mm -hmm. it, it, I can speak for myself, you know, just getting even this year with a, uh, someone who's, who's pretty on top of finances, all of a sudden a surprise extra amount for taxes due. That's just like, oh man, like I thought I was being proactive and I, you know, you miss this thing. And now all of a sudden it's like a state of 
reactivity, right? And all of these great emotions I had going in of like, yes, here's what I'm doing. It's like, it's put on the back burner to this, um, this reactive state of like, whoa, oh, hold on, fire, 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 gotta, gotta go. And it's like, you can't really make the best decisions when you're living in a life of reactivity. Um, you can survive and you can survive for a long time, but really like creating that, that energy and space in your life that you really want. So I think, um, I really appreciate that framework too. And I'll, I'll look up case and for anybody you're talking about Nick, um, and Dan, will you just share a little bit who those people are, if they want to go, uh, follow yeah, them? Yeah. yeah, them yeah. Work? Uh, Dan, Dan runs a CPA firm. Um, and he's, he, he um, I've been in his CCA class, so he does like a certainty certification. Oh, cool. I've been following him for years. Um, I think he has like a brilliant strategic mind around combining yeah. things like finance and behavior. Do you uh, know his last name? Dan Nicholson. Yeah, yeah. Nicholson, that's right. And yeah. then and then Nick Peterson. And he, of course, is now now a lot more known for Wolf Den and crypto and everything else. But we we met a while back when I had my gym. Uh he was oh, okay. consulting and things like that. So and they, they've just been a great help as far as mental models and uh, same thing. Like a lot of it, a lot of it was around like, Hey, entrepreneurs are lonely. Like you need to have somebody to talk to that understands you because most of the time your friends and family don't uh, yeah. because you just live a different lifestyle. You think about things differently. Usually we're, we're more non-conforming humans. We're trying to think of like ways to do it differently. And I, I think yeah. Yeah. it confuses and upsets a lot of people actually. So it's, it's really important to have, support of people who think differently and and i've always enjoyed that for like masterminds or coaches or anything else i think especially if you don't have a partner um yeah. it's it's crucial to you not going crazy and <laughs> yeah. yeah it's you know yeah. what i mean yeah. no I, I yeah absolutely it's, it's made a huge um you know I'm, I'm, yeah it's it's made a huge uh impact in our our I wouldn't even say just business, but life, you know, just meeting also surrounding yourself with people just so on different wavelengths. And, and I think there's something to be said for, for there's a therapy side and there's also a standard side as well. If like, when you meet people like you, Ian, we're like, no, it's my life outside of business is a non-negotiable. Like we have a high standard for maintaining that you realize, oh, there's also, there's business standards and there's like life standards as well. And um, in my experience, people who have their life standards really high tend to be much more enjoyable to be around, even if they have a few less dollars, maybe, even though I would say, I mean, I don't know that that's always accurate. So I think just those people are generally the ones you could spend time with and really want to. And 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 um, I, I do want to, um, first off, I just want to say thank you so much for taking time to be honest. I, I absolutely uh, awesome stuff. I think this is just more of the kind of conversations I, I really hope to have with people about what's what's really going on, the real side of uh, business ownership, as well as just thinking about uh, moving forward in life. And um, I I do want to say, Ian, I know um, I know you're not like actively out there on social media. Like, come work with me. I do think there will be some people who listen to this and really you know jive with you. I do know that you you do take on some consulting clients from time to time. Just if anyone's interested, like where should they reach out and maybe, you know, what, how would you define kind of the work that you do? I know it's a lot of what we've been talking about, but, um, you know, just how, how could people work with you and, uh, where should they reach out to you? Yep. So I, I take on a couple of private clients here and there. And actually at my, my, uh, my domain is callwithdad.com. Uh, <laughs> we didn't, we didn't get into the dadisms. Yeah. Yes. But, no, uh, I don't. Maybe for a part two at some point, we'll go into dadisms. Yeah, that'll be fun. It's mostly because I tell terrible jokes and usually it's like the joke, like, oh, here comes dad and asking the obvious question with the kind of voice of reason. Yeah. Um, so that's me. But yeah, you can find me on there. Find me on the Facebooks or um, usually I, it's usually a lot of referrals. On it, if I'm being real, it's usually I know yeah. somebody who knows somebody. Yeah, yeah. And they, they send me someone over. It's always a little easier to start working with someone that way. So that's my jam. So if you can find me yeah. and figure it out, that's your first step. And usually yeah. it might be a good fit if you can find me. Yeah. If you can find Ian, if you can't, um, cause I tried to find Ian on LinkedIn and man, that was a, that was a mind, uh, minefield, but you can, you can also reach out to me and I, I'll, I'll do some vetting for Ian and, uh, and connect you with Ian as well. But Ian, I, I just really want to say thank you so much for taking the time to be the first guest on the show. Um, 
if it's anything like the rest, if this is an indication of the rest of the episodes, man, I'm super excited. Um, dude, just thank you so much for taking the time. It was a pleasure. Thanks so much for having me. Got it. All right, guys. Uh, hopefully you enjoyed this episode. Uh, go follow Ian, uh, connect with him on Facebook. Uh, if you're a business owner and are looking for help and, uh, we'll see you guys on the next episode.